morning, church. You doing okay? Yeah? You hanging in there? No, that wasn't very convincing. Um, I, I'm super thankful that you're here in our midst and uh, super thankful for those of you that are joining us, part of our online family. Thank you so much for diving in with us as well. Uh, today um, is an important time as we lean into Christmas. Um, how many of you right now are excited about Christmas coming? Okay, that's pretty good. How many of you are stressed about Christmas coming? Okay, how many of you are both excited and stressed about Christmas, right? I know. Um, I've got an idea. If you have friends that you hate, I've got a gift idea for you. Um, no joke, KFC, for $20, you can buy the Kentucky Fried Chicken Yule Log. And you burn this log in your fireplace, and it makes your entire house smell like Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> really? Is that necessary? <laughs> for another $20, you can bathe in the Colonel's slaw. What's next? For an extra 50, the Colonel will come lick the chicken directly off your fingers. That's what finger licking good means. You could feel the stress just building, just thinking about it. Christmas is kind of that odd mixture of both the excitement, the joy of the real meaning of the season centered around Jesus, uh, but with our culture and the pressure that we put on ourselves or other people put on us, there is definitely a sense of stress or concern about this time of year. Some of you that maybe have gone through uh, loss or some other hardship this year or in years past. It's always difficult to get through this season, maybe without the one that you love. And so this is, uh, we know full well, a season that's, that's difficult, um, even though it is anchored in something that is incredibly joy-filled. The, the truth is, is that even our own walk with God even, even the reality of what it is to be a follower of Jesus can be mixed with the same excitement and stress, right? There are huge joys and blessings that come with being a follower of God. There are also uh, some stresses, some burdens, some concerns. It's not always easy to be a follower of God. And so for today, if you're like me and you... Uh, when it comes to following Jesus, experience both the stress and the joy, then today is for you. If around the corner in the weeks and months to come, as a follower of God, you are simultaneously experiencing joy and some of the hardship that comes with being a Christian, then today is for you as well. Last week, we looked at Joseph. Uh, today, we look at Mary. And Mary is one of those people in the scriptures that I find to be such a huge role model uh, of her faith, such an amazing model and example of when posed with uh, what God wanted to do in her life and through her life, man, oh man, you talk about a mixture of excitement and stress, Mary, Mary sums that up. But how she walked it out is so insightful for me when I dove into these scriptures these last couple of weeks. If you have your Bible, take a look with me. Go to Luke, go to chapter one, and we'll take a look at this account from Luke. If you're familiar with the Christmas story, even if you're not in church much, uh, here you go. Luke chapter one, skip down to verse 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondering what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, 
you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. And then verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Can you imagine being Mary? I mean, put yourself just in her shoes just for a moment. Imagine the volume of emotions, thoughts, questions that you'd begin to process through. What in the world is my husband going to think? What are others going to think, especially considering the nature of this pregnancy? What kind of mom am I going to be, much less the mom of God? What am I going to have to go through, not just in pregnancy, but raising a child and being a mom of a child all the way into adulthood. If he's the son of God, as I know he is, then what is he going to have to go through? The mother's heart starts to kick in. I can't imagine the volume of things that you'd begin to uh, concern yourself with when you found out that God wanted to use you in that particular way. Now, the Jewish people had been expecting a savior, a Messiah, century after century after century, and it would be nothing more exciting and honoring than to be the one through whom God brings the Messiah. So yes, tremendous excitement mixed with this huge, daunting task that was going to be ahead of her. You know that when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, it's that same sort of odd mixture of the joy and the blessings, as well as a a kind of daunting, often isolating experience to be a follower of Jesus, isn't it? It's not always easy to follow Christ. It's not always easy to do what God wants you to do. It can be a challenge. It's a narrow road that few people find. Jesus in Luke chapter nine, just some chapters later in this same account has kind of an interesting moment where where Jesus reinforces the cost that comes for those that will follow him. Yes, there's joy. Yes, there's blessing, but there is a cost. Somebody comes up to Jesus and says, uh, I'll follow where you, wherever you go, Jesus. I will follow you absolutely anywhere. And Jesus senses that, that maybe his, his response is a little too quick. Maybe the guy wants to follow because of some perceived glamour that comes with it or just for the blessings of it, but has completely missed that there is a cost to following Jesus. And Jesus responds, hey, uh, foxes, they've got holes to live in. Birds have nests, but the son of man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. It's not the, the, quite the sales pitch if you just wanted to get people following you. But Jesus wanted to make sure that his followers knew what they were getting into. Are there huge blessings that can only be found in a relationship with him? You better believe it. But are there challenges that come with walking the narrow road? Are there some cost to being a disciple of Jesus Christ? You bet. 
Shortly after, a couple other people come. And this time, Jesus does the inviting. He says, come, follow me. Come, follow me. And both of these individuals respond to the invitation not too fast, but in this case, too slow. Come, follow me. And they both respond with some version of, yeah, that sounds good. But first, let me take care of this. Oh, no, no, that sounds good, Jesus. But first, let me deal with this. In other words, they were saying, okay, what you've got for me is good, Jesus, but just not right now. And and there, Jesus responds again pretty directly. He says, nobody that puts their hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus is just saying, hey, listen up. When it comes to following me, this is a serious deal. It requires a focus. It requires determination. It requires obedience. It requires sacrifice, uh, perseverance. This is no small thing. Are there tremendous blessings of the power of the living God being alive in you? Yes. Are there the blessings of his grace and his mercy? Yes. Are the blessings of eternal life promised to you? Yes. But between the time that you step into a relationship with Jesus and then he calls you home, is it always going to be easy? No. And this narrow road that he's called us to is a very, very special one, filled oftentimes simultaneously with the blessings that are always there for his kids, the promises, the word of God that never, ever fails. And yet the reality of the day in, the day out, the struggles of what it is to do what God's called us to do. Do you think it's always easy for Jay and Caitlin Greer to be in a completely different culture with 1% of the population being aware or having access to Jesus? No. But at some point, in the riches of the blessing that they have received in having this relationship with God, they also were willing to not just get comfortable, but to lay down their life for Jesus, to be perseverant in their faith for Jesus, And Mary, to me, was was a woman like that. At this stage in their life, honestly, just a girl like that. And I'm so blown away by, by looking at her and her heart that as she receives what God has for her, it would have been daunting. It would have been isolating. But at the same time, what else would you do? If God Almighty had opened up his word to you and said, I've got something for you to do. I've wired you unique. I've given you gifts and blessings. And so I would like you to use them. And then I've given you something for you to do. I've wired you unique and given you these blessings and I want you to use them. And then I've I've made you unique and I've given you some blessings and I want you to use them. When you put it that way, you go, okay, sure. Look back at Mary's response. Look at verse 28. It says, the angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. That's a good line. Those are some good words. If Jesus said, hey, you're highly favored and I'm with you, the Lord God is going to be with you. Okay, sounds pretty good to me. But look at Mary's response, verse 21. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. She's wrestling with the greeting. She's wrestling with... Those words being spoken to her. 
But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Do you know there's a tremendous humility to Mary? There is a humility that said, I'm totally aware that I am not God Almighty. I know him and I'm not him. I think a lot of us wrestle with unworthiness. There's, there's kind of a nagging sense in a lot of our journeys where we just go, gosh, I'm not worthy to be used by God. I'm not worthy to even be a relationship with God, much less let him do something in and through me or with my life. And I'm burdened for that. I'm burdened for that if you're a kid or you're a teenager or you're an adult or a senior adult and you wrestle with that sense of unworthiness. And the first time I read through this, I thought, well, she's just doing that normal thing of just kind of wrestling with, you know, I'm not worthy. And, and that's when you say I'm favored and you've got this plan. Well, I'm not really worthy. I don't actually, the more I lean into this, the more I don't think that's where she was. I think that's normal for a lot of us to wrestle with unworthiness. But sometimes I think what's harder than wrestling with unworthiness is when God says, hey, you are worthy. Now what? We use our unworthiness as a big excuse. <laughs> no, I'm not worthy to be in a relationship with God or, uh, okay, I get that you want to be in a relationship with me because you're extra gracious and merciful, but I'm certainly not worthy to be used by you until God grabs a hold of you <laughs> by the power of his Holy Spirit and the truth of his word and speak something different over you. And that's what he does with Mary. I, I don't know how exactly she was feeling, but I think she really started to wrestle with, wait a minute, regardless of how I feel, God says I am worthy and for whatever reason I have found favor with him. Game on. Christian, some of you may have jumped into a relationship with Jesus in some senses too quick. You didn't really know the full scope of what you were doing when you stepped into a relationship with Almighty God. Others of you, maybe it was too slow. You had years and years and years of that sounds good, but not right now, or I'll get to it later. But regardless of where you're at, right here and right now, today, if God speaks up and he says, I made you, I created you, and then I sent my son Jesus to die for you, and he conquered sin and conquered death, and then he rose from the grave, and now he's desiring to rescue you from your sin, and he wants to be alive in you, actively involved in you. And he wants to change your identity, not from what you think or what you feel or what other people have said, but that you then would be defined by what he says about you, about how you really are from your creator's perspective. Now, if you start to think of yourself differently than God says about you, if God says you're worthy, and you say, I'm not worthy, one of you's mistaken. I can tell you which one it is if you really want to know. Come see me after. <laughs> but he's got a life for you to live. He's got a mission for you. He's got purpose for you. Now, yes, this was a unique mission and purpose for Mary. But did you know that God's got a unique mission and purpose for you too? It's not going to be to be the mom of the Messiah. But he created you unique and special. He's got something for you. And you have at times, I'm sure, felt unworthy. But then I hope that at some point you have heard straight from God him say, uh-uh, you, you are worthy. Not because of anything you've done, but because of everything I did. I made you worthy. 
Now you got to wrestle with that. For you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared in advance for you to do. You either believe that or you don't. That is more true about you than what you think or what you feel. And there was something about the humility of Mary that just received these honoring, weighty words from God. There was something in her humility that just said, okay. Because you notice the only question that she asks, it's not, uh, am I worthy or how could I be worthy or why me? She just says, how is this going to happen? She wasn't questioning that it could happen. She just asked a really legitimate question. Hey, uh, this is a big deal, having a kid. Uh, I'm not married. Can you explain to me how this is going to happen, or is that a surprise too? And he sees, oh, no, let me, let me tell you. Oh, okay. May it be then as you said. Man, the humility of that is just so great. Just, it's kind of that childlike faith that just receives from a good parent what they're speaking to you. Okay, that, that's true. I got it. And... and just like Mary, I, I think maybe you and I need to be reminded that a humble condition doesn't equal a worthless condition. Just because you're humble and meek doesn't mean that you're worthless. Quite the opposite. It's that humility that God can flood through. When you're weak, then he is strong, that whole thing. And he really has something for you. And I love what Mary does here quite, quite simply is she leans into two things that God is still using today to calm the daunting, often isolating nature of what it is to follow Jesus. He has given us his word and he's given us his people to be a comfort, to be a help. He's given us his Holy Spirit to be a comfort, to be a help to me and you, because he knows that it's not always easy. And we need to look to him, have a Godward focus. We need to be sensitive to his Holy Spirit. And yes, we do need some of the people around us to be tangible representation or reminders of what it is that God has called us to. That's why I believe when she hears this word, I mean, she says, okay, I'm going to take you at your word. Now, let me go be with some godly people. Where does she go next? She goes to be with her relative Elizabeth. And if you keep reading verses 39 through 45, she goes to Elizabeth, her relative, because she needs some tangible sort of comfort. She, she needs a godly counsel and someone to share the excitement with, but I'm sure also process some of the stress or the, oh my goodness. And she meets up with Elizabeth and they have this amazing time. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth as a godly woman, pronounces a blessing on Mary. And then Mary gives this amazing song. This amazing poem is her response and you can see where Mary's focus is. It's where our focus should be. As I read through this, look, is Mary's focus on herself or her strength or her ability to navigate the years to come? Is it on, on uh, her circumstances? No, what you're going to find is her focus is on the Lord. As she sings this song, and that's where our focus should be as well in the midst of what it is that we, we follow God in these crazy seasons. It's not my track record. It's not your track record. It's his track record that's worth looking at. Look at verse 46. Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. 
From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He's scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And then I love verse 56. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Her focus is on God himself, God's track record, God's word, God's promises, God's faithfulness. Man, if you zero in on your word, your track record, your background, your past, you probably got good reason to feel like what's ahead of you is daunting. But if you keep your focus on the Lord and his word on a daily basis, he'll pull your sights to where they should be. And then I love that he's, he, he's given us this little gem here. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months. In the midst of some of the most daunting, difficult seasons, God has given you, brothers and sisters in Christ, family, friends, to lean into. You need them and they need you in those seasons to be a strength and a comfort, a tangible reminder of what God's up to in your journey. That is so, so key for me and you going forward. Otherwise, the enemy can come in and pluck you off this narrow road. He can distract you. He, he can wipe you out. But there's too much at stake. We need to continue to listen to the Lord. And we continue to, to focus not on ourselves, but on the other people around us doing what it is that God has called us to do. In junior high, my junior high school, I had two lunches. I was in the first lunch and all my friends were in the second lunch. And in the second lunch, there were two boys that always sat alone at one table because there was nothing cool about them in any way, shape, or form. My buddies that were in that lunch, they started to see them and think on them. They had words from our youth pastor running through their minds about, gosh, Jesus loves them. We should probably go love them too. Just two of my friendship group turned to the rest of their friendship group and said, we should go sit with those kids over there. We should go eat with them. And the other friend said, are you crazy? Why, why would you do that? That's going to be social suicide. If you go start spending your time over there, people are going to think that you're like them and you're going to just fall into a whole bunch of other, you know, normal junior high stuff that you don't want to fall into. Don't do that. And it took a sense of courage for two of the friends in that friendship group that had brought it up in the first place. It took a sense of them being really focused not on what everybody else was saying or even potential of what might happen, but on the character and the nature of God and what God's word has to say about loving the people around us. And they went over and they sat down and they ate with those kids anyway not just once, but every single day for the next couple of weeks. To the point that it got so, so weird that the rest of the friendship group, Christian kids, began to make fun of the two that had joined the other two. What, what the Christian friends had said would happen did happen. The two that joined the ones that were loners started getting grouped in with them. But the Christians that were hanging with the loner kids, they started to realize, gosh, there's something special about these two and unique and interesting. And they found out that they were actually really great people. 
they didn't know Jesus. There became a relationship there enough where those two friends invited them to their youth group, where then they heard about the gospel. And over time, those two just continued to hang with the two that they'd gone over to join and let the others figure out if they were going to really live out the Christian life or not. About three, four weeks had gone by, and one of the two loner kids came up to one of the two Christian kids that had been eating with him and handed him a letter and then walked away. The Christian friend opened it up, and he read the letter, and he said, a few weeks ago, I was ready to take my own life. I didn't believe in God. I'd been bullied. I'd been minimized. I'd been pushed out to the outside from my family, from this school, from everybody. And I prayed the night before, God, if you're real, if you even exist, and I'm sure you don't, then you need to send someone to show me that you're real and that you love me. And if you don't, then I'm going to take my life by the end of the school day. He said, that was the same day that you and your friend came and sat down at my table. And it changed everything. But it came from a place of two individuals taking seriously what it is to walk with Jesus, listening to the word of God, being humbled before God, and just saying, yes, Lord, use me, whatever you wanna do in and through me. I'm not gonna get out ahead of you and I'm not gonna lag behind you. I want to be a follower of yours, whatever may come. And they continued to. And you and I need to continue to be those sorts of people. Do you know how many people in our own community and Japan and everywhere in between need some obedient, courageous, faithful followers of Jesus that continually look to him for direction? and then offer themselves to the people around them. To that end, may you and I live, just like Mary. And so gracious Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the faithful followers in here who have given so much of themselves, who even though doing what you've called them to do is not always easy. They continue to take that step of faith, that step of obedience. Remind them that they are worthy in your sight because of what you are doing in their life, because of what you have spoken over them, because of what you are making true in them. And then use us, Father, to be faithful to the calling that you've placed on our life, whatever that might be. We give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen.